G'day everyone, I'm Ebony Bennett, Deputy Director at the Australia Institute and welcome to our webinar series. This is our final webinar for uh, the election campaign period, the last one before election day. I wanna welcome you all, thanks for joining us. Today we're talking to the Greens leader, Adam Bent, about phasing out fossil fuels. To begin, I would like to acknowledge that I live and work on Ngunnawal and Ngambri country and pay my respects to elders past and present. Sovereignty was never ceded and this always was and always will be Aboriginal land. Days and times for the Australia Institute's webinars do vary, so please head on over to australiainstitute.org.au uh, to find details of all our upcoming events. And just a few tips before we begin to make sure it all runs smoothly. If you hover over the bottom of your Zoom screen, you should be able to see a QA and a box where you can type in questions for Adam. You should also be able to upvote other people's questions and make comments on them. A reminder to please keep things civil and on topic in the chat or we'll boot you out. And lastly, a reminder that this discussion is being recorded and it will go up on our YouTube channel. That's australiainstitute.tv uh, later today. So there's only two days until election day and it feels like climate change has not been uh, the biggest election issue that it deserves to be compared to things like cost of living, but we know it is a very important issue to a lot of voters around Australia. ABC's Vote Compass revealing that climate change is the most important issue for voters this election. And even just this past Sunday on Insiders, I noticed uh, when talking Vox Pops with people out on the street in the electorate of Reed, climate change kept coming up time and again as a big issue, despite it not featuring as heavily in a lot of political commentary. Uh, we've been hearing also a lot of warnings about the supposed chaos that could arise with a hung parliament when we know the last minority government under Julia Gillard with the Greens and independence in shared balance of power was the most productive parliament in Australian history. It passed many major reforms, including the NDIS and the clean energy package, which obviously brings us back to climate change and its cause, fossil fuels. Australia cannot tackle climate change without tackling the source of the problem, which is gas, coal and oil. And to discuss how we deal with that problem in detail, I'm delighted to introduce today's guest, Adam Bent, the member for Melbourne and leader of the Australian Greens. Welcome, Adam. Hi, Benny. Thanks for having me. And joining him today is uh, Richie Merzian, Climate and Energy Program Director at the Australia Institute. Um, Adam... Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm sure you are uh, got a lot of things to do in the last days of the campaign, so we really appreciate your time. Let's begin with Australia's fossil fuel exports. Why is it so important that Australia reins in its fossil fuel exports as well as its domestic fossil fuel use? Yeah, so as you mentioned in your opening, it's coal and gas, certainly from Australia's perspective, that are the biggest causes of the climate crisis. And... Uh, in an election where we've been talking a lot about uh, renewables or to a certain extent renewables, uh, which is really welcome that we're seeing a shift towards a discussion about getting more renewables into the system. One of the things that hasn't been spoken about uh, by either Liberal or Labor is how we get coal and gas out of the system. And of course, that's what matters to, to the climate. That's what matters to the planet. Um, so we've got to get out of coal and gas. Australia's contributor... Uh, is as a massive, massive exporter of coal and gas pollution, as well as a big user domestically. Um, so we export about four, maybe up to five times, depending on um, when you look at it, but around about four times as much thermal coal as we use domestically for energy. So uh, and, uh, we are the third largest exporter of fossil fuel pollution in the world, um, as well as being the world's largest exporter of coal. So it's actually what we dig up and then sort of ship overseas that matters as much, if not more, uh, to, the, to the climate as what we do here domestically. So it's something that we've really got to tackle uh, in Australia is the digging up and burning uh, of coal and uh, gas in particular. So um, as one of the world's largest polluters, we need a plan to get out of coal and gas, one that looks after coal and gas communities along the way, but that is honest about the discussion that, look, we actually need to fa start phasing it out domestically, but also phase out uh, the export of it, because we know that across the world, 
coal and gas are not being burnt at sustainable rates. They're being burnt at rates that will harm Australia and harm the world. So it's in our own self-interest, as well as being a good contributor to the global fight against climate change, that uh, we come up with a plan to get past coal and gas. And what would the Greens plan look like for that? Because it's not something that's well canvassed, I think, in the policy debate, in particular um, exports, but really that idea of phasing out fossil fuels is, is just um, one that doesn't get a lot of airtime compared to, as you said, um, increasing renewables. Um, what does it look like for Australia? What can we do? What are some of the mechanisms that we could uh, use to, to work towards phasing out fossil fuels? Yeah, so we've we've released our um, comprehensive plan powering past coal and gas, which you can get on greens.org.au, and that's what I want to talk a bit about um, today, and I'll be talking about measures that are from there. I guess the starting point is, uh, and this is something that we're pushing very hard this election, is we've got to stop making the problem worse. So we've got to stop opening new coal and gas projects. Like you can't put the fire out while you're pouring petrol on it. And there's 114 new coal and gas projects in the pipeline across the country. At the moment, Liberal and Labor back them all. So the starting point from, our, from us this election is to um, push, firstly, to keep the Liberals out, and then secondly, to push the next government to say, we've got to stop opening new coal and gas projects. That's one of the, the biggest things that we've got to do. Then what we need, uh, and this is something we want to progress during the course of the next parliament, is a plan that says, well, let's have a phased timetable out of coal and gas so that workers and communities have an understanding about when the change is gonna come. And then let's put in place some measures to support those workers and communities along the way so that when um, we stop digging coal, uh, there's sustainable, well-paid, secure jobs for those workers and communities to move into. So the big elements of our plan are a, a phased, um, uh, phase out or staged phase out of coal, both at home and also our exports um, for coal for energy, thermal coal between now and 2030, um, phasing out coal for uh, metallurgical coal, so it's used in steel by 2040, because we need a bit longer to, to get that green steel up to speed um, and stop opening new cat, uh, gas projects. But then also provide new businesses with incentives to come in and set up near where those coal workers are. So we're calling for a job for job guarantee and a wage guarantee, which would say basically this, um, if you're a, a business and you can come and set up and give a job to someone who used to work in coal and guarantee that worker that they will get paid the same rate that they used to get, then we, the government, will give you a subsidy to help pay that workers' wages of up to 50% for 10 years. Um, that will encourage people to come in and take on coal workers and utilise their skills that they've got and set up businesses in those regions where the coal uh, communities are because they know that they'll have good, well-trained workers and they'll get government support for it. Um, and it will also mean we'll be saying to the coal workers what the message that we've been taking to them as I've been travelling around New South Wales and Queensland, which is that coal and gas workers are not the enemy. Like we're all in this together and what we need is a plan that supports them. So they won't lose income. Um, and this, this, that plan, that sort of cornerstone of it would then be supplemented by saying, well, let's work out how we grow new businesses in areas like green steel, green metals, green minerals, green hydrogen, that in many instances are going to be in the places where a lot of these, uh, the, the coal communities are and the gas communities are, so that you are then creating really good sustainable industries, including new export industries to replace coal and gas that a lot of these workers are going to be able to move over into. Yeah. Um, Adam, that's a, a very much a domestic focused plan. Um, internationally, you know, Australia doesn't have the greatest record at, for example, uh, COPs, COP26, um, the most recent one. Uh, what would the Greens like to see the next Australian government do in terms of joining international efforts? We saw the UK kind of leading um, around coal. The US was focused at the last COP around reducing methane gas emissions. How would the Greens like the next government to uh, re-engage around climate action internationally? 
Yeah, it's a, it's a really good point because Australia is actually a really critical player at these negotiations because we're such a large exporter and have got such a big um, footprint as a country, the, uh, we are a really, really significant player. And there's this kind of this myth that, oh, well, what can one country do? And Australia has low emissions domestically, of course, not taking into account the pollution that we're responsible for on the world stage. But one of the things that's not often realised is that these conferences, they work by consensus. And when Australia's there as a big player um, on the world stage in terms of uh, the, the amount of coal and gas we produce, like Australia up till now has played a massive sabotage and blocking role. And it can sit there as one country and a key country and say, no, we're not going to sign on. And what that does is it slows down the rest of the world. And um, it also gives other countries an excuse to say, well, why should we act if Australia's not acting? So Australia stepping up at these climate uh, summits, although we're a small power, I guess, diplomatically speaking, we're a big player in the climate um, stakes. Australia stepping up and showing leadership and saying, for example, we're going to stop opening new coal and gas mines would be a game changer. Like it would really be a game changer. It would be one of those things that would start the dominoes falling and could see then other countries start to say, okay, well, if Australia as a rich country is going to start taking action, we're going to join on. Like we've got no excuse anymore for, for, um, for not joining in. So we would like to see Australia join um, a number of international, uh, I guess, movements that are happening. One is that the one that's being led by the US President Joe Biden, which is to start phasing out gas and have a reduction in gas. And the reason that that's critical is, as I'm sure many people watching this know, but methane is actually a much more toxic climate gas than CO2. And so in the short term, if we wanted to have a big impact, we should start phasing out methane. And so Joe Biden has a pledge to get uh, people to start doing that, to cutting um, methane use, Australia should sign on to that. Like that would be a big, big move around the world. Secondly, we should join other countries like uh, Canada and the UK that have been um, pushing for uh, this group of countries called the Powering Past Coal Alliance, where the developed countries, as well as others, um, but it's being led by a lot of developed countries are saying, let's work out a global plan to support this transition out of coal. And I think in many respects, those two things and joining up to pledges like that are going to be the entry ticket to future negotiations, to being taken seriously in these global climate negotiations. And for Australia to start to go to the next climate summit saying, we've put a cap on new coal and gas, we're not opening anymore. Um, we want to join in with you now in a discussion, a worldwide discussion about how we get out of existing coal and gas uh, would, would be a game changer. You know, would it be moving as fast as the Greens would like? Yeah, we would really like to see action by 2030, but it could really set the ball rolling. Um, and I, that's why I actually feel quite optimistic about um, the prospect. If we can get a change of government this election and push the next government to do some of those things, then I feel optimistic about um, the, that global momentum towards taking climate action. Yeah, um, and obviously, if you're aiming uh, at least for a higher target, you might get there uh, and you're well on the way, obviously, um, uh, even better if uh, uh, things are more difficult than expected. Richie, I was going to ask you there, I think Adam's referring to uh, or has been some Australia Institute research released prior to the last COP about those hundred uh, more than 100 gas and coal projects in the pipeline and, um, and the emissions life cycle emissions from those, but um, you went to that COP in Glasgow. Is there a bit of a failure in international climate processes to talk about the responsibility for exported emissions from countries like Australia that are involved in, in supplying fossil fuels to the world? Yeah, it is, it is a big gap in the international space. <clears throat> and if you think about it, it's odd when you recognise that fossil fuels are the major source of greenhouse gas emissions, and that's the problem then why aren't you going after the supply as much as sort of the users? If this was narcotics, if this was weapons, there'd be just as much attention on the suppliers as there would be on the users here. But the, the suppliers can rock up to these conferences, host big events, get the Australian government to host a pavilion, rock up to their event. Um, and so you don't have the focus in the right place. <clears throat> and the UK was trying to address this by having these 
events on the margins where they did address supply and the powering past call lines is a great example. <clears throat> in fact, the ACT government was, I think, the first jurisdiction in Australia to sign up. The city of Melbourne and the city of Sydney are both members of it, but it would be great to see Australia sign up to that, recognise there won't be any more coal-fired power stations built and phase down the existing ones. Um, and then the other thing that was great about that initiative in addressing the supply, the UK worked closely with South Africa, the largest coal user and producer in Africa, to stitch up this amazing deal to get South Africa to expedite the closure of their own coal industry. The Indonesians, the largest exporter of thermal coal in the world, saw that and said, we'll have some of that. If you can stitch up a deal, we'll do that. That's, that's the value of actually engaging in these international processes. And Australia could be playing a role in expediting that. Instead, it plays a role in obstructing those kind of deals. And that's really what would change. And I think signing up to the Powering Pass call lines would be a good sign, a good faith article of doing that. Mm. Um, Adam, coming back to you, we know that the federal government um, gives billions in subsidies to the fossil fuel industry every year. And in the most recent budget, uh, we identified a further three to four billion in additional support, in particular for the gas industry and um, uh, opening up new gas fields and things like that. The Greens, I think, have a very different policy to end those types of subsidies what would that look like how would you go about doing that yeah you're right i mean there's we've got these big coal and gas corporations that are making billions of dollars in many instances sending all their profits offshore and very often not even paying any tax at all um, but you know it doesn't stop there the government then steps in and says how can we actually take money from the public purse and give it to you um, and give you subsidies as well as uh, allowing you to not pay any tax and where and I think your research has found that it's about $22,000 a minute. Um, and uh, it's, so we're talking about in the order of about $10 billion a year that is going to these industries and these sectors that ultimately need um, to be managed out because we know coal and gas are the problem, but we're propping them up using public money. And uh, so our, our plan, our climate plan over 10 years looks at the cost of um, building a, a big build of renewable energy. So for us, it's Snowy Hydro 3.0. So let's build over the next 10 years um, the equivalent of the current coal-fired power fleet, but do it with renewables. Uh, let's um, invest in things like green metals uh, where, and minerals, where we've got the second largest supply of a mineral called vanadium that is used in batteries that are used at the, the utility scale. Like let's invest in all of these things and let's support the coal workers as in the way that I've said before, but fund it in part by removing some of those subsidies uh, and also making these big gas corporations that um, currently make, well, well, 27 gas corporations made $77 billion in revenue and paid not one cent of tax, like let's in one year let's make them start paying tax. And when you cost that out over um, 10 years, as we got the parliamentary budget office to do, you actually save the budget $52 billion, right? So money that could then be invested in affordable housing or making childcare free. So the, the, the subsidies that are going there, um, plus the fact that many of them don't pay their fair share of tax, um, and you have a nurse paying more tax than a multinational in Australia in many instances, and it's just wrong. Um, you close those loopholes, stop the handouts, make them pay their fair share of tax, and you can fund the transition and actually save the budget money. Um, and I mean, one example, just, just on one sort of illustration, there was, there's was there been a lot of discussion about um, fuel excise following Russia's invasion of the Ukraine. And so everyday people got a temporary cut from 44 cents to 22 cents a litre that would last for six months. And I think what is often not known is that, you know, when Clive Palmer takes his mining trucks to the uh, uh, to get filled up, he, they pay the tax, um, those corporations, and then at the end of the year, every year, they get a big rebate. Um, the, the public pays for these mining corporations to have tax-free diesel. Like, let's stop, let's make them pay the same tax that everyone else has to on things like petrol and diesel uh, and use that to fund the transition. Mm. Uh, yeah, certainly it opens up a, a lot more possibilities if we're not kind of, yeah, as you said, handing that money out to companies that are hugely profitable and in many cases, not paying any tax at all. Um, I did want to move next to um, 
carbon credits. Um, and again, this draws a little bit on some Australia Institute research, but I know that the Greens were instrumental in negotiating the carbon pricing mechanism under the last Labor government, which covered about 80% of the economy and successfully reduced emissions while the economy continued to grow. Um, but carbon credits were only supposed to cover about 20% or the other 20% to incentivize abatement. It's kind of supposed to be a, a, a last resort uh, where abatement is more difficult. But our research has shown that the Emissions Reduction Fund and its central, it's a central policy, um, a lot of carbon credits lack integrity, basically being hot air. They're not actually additional um, in terms of reducing emissions. What role do the Greens think that carbon credits should play in reducing emissions? And are you concerned about um, these issues of integrity that have been raised by the Australia Institute, but also whistleblowers like Professor Andrew McIntosh? Yeah, we are concerned. And um, the fundamental reason is this. So it's, you, you correctly sort of outlined the history of it. And so it's basically when we... Um, uh, established that uh, putting a price on pollution and making the polluters start to pay the cost of some of their pollution. One of the things that we also set up in that was a mechanism, for example, for farmers to be able to make money and gain some of that money by um, changing the way that they manage their land, perhaps re replanting, uh, changing their, their agricultural practices, uh, and then being rewarded financially for doing that. And uh, what then happened was Tony Abbott came along and got rid of the carbon price, so stopped the idea of polluters having to pay the public and instead turned it around and said, right, public, the public is now going to um, start paying. And so they set up this fund and said, we're going to um, pay for um, some emissions reduction. But, of course, what we found out over the last few years is that um, that fund has been, uh, according to whistleblowers, really, like, poorly managed and poorly regulated and there's no guarantee that when the fund is paying out public money for um, so-called permits that are meant to reduce pollution there's not even any guarantee that that's actually happening and the problem is that really that that under uh, first of all it shows that the Tony Abbott approach was wrong of saying that we're going to um, shift away from making the polluters pay um, but second it's raised big questions about the integrity of uh, the, these credits that are being paid. And that's a problem down the line for, for two reasons. One is, um, as you indicated, we've got to make sure that whatever scheme we come up with in the next parliament, that it's one that actually makes pollution less. Right? It's not just an offset scheme. It's actually got to start cutting pollution that's, been, that's being put into the air. So we can't just use offsets to uh, avoid having to cut pollution. But secondly, farmers and the way um, we manage the land in Australia is going to be critical because like, one of the best ways that we could um, avoid putting more pollution into the air, for example, is to stop logging our native forests um, and also to incentivise farmers to start doing things better. Uh, but to do that, you're going to need a carbon credit scheme that's got integrity and to do that, we do think, and especially following the Australian Institute of research, we do think like we've got to have a review, we've got to get some integrity back in the system and we've got to make sure that what's happening is not money being sprayed around without actually any greenhouse benefit. There's got to be some integrity in the system. Yeah, Richie, if I can just bring you in there. Um, obviously, the Australia Institute has some concerns going back to research that we did jointly with the Australian Conservation Foundation. Um, but can you just tell us more about some of those integrity concerns and, and why it's so important? Yeah, so, I mean, the government spent, um, this is a $4.5 billion fund. Uh, the government is the main purchaser of these carbon credits and the majority of the carbon credits have come through three methods. One is avoided deforestation in Western New South Wales. The second is human induced regeneration. So trying to regrow forests. And then the third is waste um, landfill gas in waste sites. All three of those methods have major issues in terms of whether they're at, you're actually buying emissions reductions that would have happened anyway, or whether those emissions reductions even happened. If we look at the avoided deforestation one, for example, the government spent you know hundreds of millions of dollars 
paying for landholders not to clear their land based on permits they got from the New South Wales government. But the expectation, the baseline that they assumed existed for deforestation in Western New South Wales was ridiculously high. Um, you wouldn't have enough bulldozers in New South Wales to actually pretend like there was enough land clearing to incentivize that. And the proof is in the pudding, land clearing rates went up regardless of all that money spent. These are the integrity issues and they cover about up to 80% of the carbon credits that have been generated. And what we're seeing now is a federal government that's rushing to create more methods like incentivizing carbon capture and storage, which we know Santos has jumped off the back of. Um, and the integrity committee that sits within the clean energy regulator has been stacked with fossil fuel interests as well. The new chair of the integrity body is a fossil fuel lobbyist. He's the one who replaced Professor Andrew McIntosh, who's, you know, w blew the whistle on all this. The clean energy regulator itself finally needs an overhaul. The CER develops the methods, regulates the methods, buys most of the credits. Now that's just poor governance and it explains why I think we're in such a poor position right now. Any parliament that's coming into place post Saturday needs to review the methods, review the governance and review the very purpose of the emissions reduction fund because I don't think it's fit for purpose anymore and we should be looking at how we can actually get serious emissions reductions in ways we know work. Thanks, Richie. I know we've got close to 400 people on the line with us today. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm coming to questions from the audience just shortly. But before we get there, um, Adam, there's been a lot of talk about the balance of power in the next parliament and particularly the idea that there might be another minority government situation, depending on how the numbers fall on Saturday night. Um, I've just got a couple of questions, I guess, around this. The first one is, what would be the Greens' priorities for a minority government? You've been clear that you would pr uh, prefer uh, Labor, that you'd like to see the end of, of a Liberal government, but what would be your policy priorities for um, negotiations? Yeah, the um, it's, uh, look, we'll know soon enough um, what voters decide, but the polls are suggesting and many commentators are suggesting that is a reality. And of course, in the Senate, um, it there will be shared power in the Senate. No one party is going to have a majority in the Senate and the Greens are set to be in balance of power potentially in um, our own right. And we've been very clear. Uh, if we are in a minority parliament situation after Saturday, then firstly, we want to see the government gone and we need a change of government. This government has made the climate crisis worse, has made housing affordability worse. Uh, they've got to go for, uh, for many, many reasons. But um, we will be pushing the next government, the next Labor government to do better on a number of fronts. On the climate front, uh, our uh, demand that we'll be putting on the table for negotiation in a power uh, sharing parliament would be stop opening new coal and gas mines. Um, there are 114, as it said, on the books that uh, will be below any chance of meeting any climate targets. And uh, like, distressingly, we know the Liberals are terrible. We know the Liberals want to use public money to open up coal and gas mines. But sadly, at this election, Labor's backed them, backed them in and uh, is continuing to say that we can keep opening up new coal and gas mines and mine it well out into the 2050s and still meet our climate targets when we just can't. Um, so we'd be willing to have a debate during the course of the next parliament about climate targets, what a scheme would look like, all of these issues that we've aired today. But our um, number one uh, uh, demand that we'll be putting on the table will be stop opening up new coal and gas mines. Um, we've also got, like, we're also in a cost of living crisis at the moment. So we want to see some key reforms on that front as well. And top of the list there would be getting dental into Medicare. Uh, we got it in, we got dental into Medicare for kids last time there was a power sharing parliament. We want to finish the job and get it in for everyone and um, build affordable homes and make childcare free. And we've got some others that, um, uh, uh, that include around wiping student debt progress on First Nations lifting income support, but they're the ones that would be at the top of our list and they're ones that we think we could get some progress on with the next government. Uh, the future of coal and gas is probably, to, like, to be frank, is probably going to be the one that's the biggest sticking point. Um, Labor has wedded itself so much to opening up more coal and gas mines, but I just think that approach won't chime with the Australian people. I think people understand that we're in a climate crisis and don't want coal and gas open. And so our approach will be 
um, to kick the Liberals out, but to push the next government to take that climate action that science requires. Um, the other thing that I've noticed these last couple of weeks has been a real focus on supposed instability or chaos if there ends up being a number of independents in the lower house. Um, obviously, the Green, you're expecting the Greens to do very well, and in particular in the Senate, as you mentioned. Um, just to counter that, I guess, you've experienced that minority government situation uh, under the Gillard government where the Greens and a couple of independents um, shared in power there. Um, I asked this to the independents that we spoke to last week, Helen Haynes and Zali Stegall. I mean, can you give people a picture of uh, how you operate with the other independents and how parliament worked the last time you're in a minority government situation? Is there really anything to fear here? Look, our priority would be for to have three years of stable, effective and progressive government. And we think that with good lines of communication, good operations, but working together with the government, but also, there might, as you say, there might be others on the crossbench like there were last time, we can have that. And during the course of this parliament, uh, what we've seen is that on a lot of issues, we come from pretty different and diverse parts of the country, sitting there on the crossbench, myself, um, Helen Haynes and Zali Stegall, as you mentioned, and even over to Andrew Wilkie and Bob Catter uh, and others. So there's a, and, and that crossbench may well grow. But what we've shown is a willingness to um, like continue to vote differently where it's in the interest of our constituencies, but also to work together where there's areas of common interest. And so integrity has been one of those and a push for a federal ICAC. But also even on these questions of coal and gas, there's been... Um, uh, and climate, uh, and, and indeed even lifting income support as well has been one of those areas where um, people are on that crossbench are willing to um, vote according to their constituencies and vote according to their policies. And it's been uh, us who have bought this, this, this really critical crossbench that have brought a bunch of issues to parliament and got them on the agenda. And one of the, uh, uh, I think, things to note about that 2010 parliament is that we got some really good reforms. We made Parliament a bit more democratic. We got the Parliamentary Budget Office. We got dental into Medicare for kids. We got things like the Clean Energy Finance Corporation and the Australian Renewable Energy that have survived all of the Liberals' attempts to repeal them. And now the Liberals go to climate conferences and, and, and sing their praises and say this is a key part of Australia's emissions reduction policies. We got some really good stuff. And um, I think with that, provided that you have that willingness to have open communication and just respect that you're going to vote differently at different times, but be willing to work together where there are issues that you want to see progress on together. It can be really stable and really effective. Um, and let's not forget that we've actually got a minority parliament at the moment. You've got Liberals in the minority and you've got Nationals holding the balance of power. Like Barnaby Joyce has been in balance of power for a very long time and um, minority parliament, in a sense, is not a new thing to Australia, but when you bring more third voices to the table, I think you will find it be a lot more open and transparent, like the coalition agreement's a secret agreement, like who knows what's actually in it, and they do all their deals behind closed doors, we would be open and transparent. And I think on the big issues facing us, and I'll sort of finish on this, that I think there's a growing willingness and desire and um, in fact, urgency from people to say, you've got to all work together. And like, you've, we're tackling some big issues. Um, will everyone get everything they want? You know, probably not. Will you be able to work together to get something that is good for us and good for the country? Yes. And I think there's, um, when you look at the ACT, where you've got Greens and Labor uh, working together in government and getting the, the, the territory running on 100% renewables and delivering for people, I think people look at that and think, yeah, we want um, our politicians to work together on the big issues. Mm. We might go to questions from the audience now. So just a reminder, you can type in those questions using the Q&A box and uh, I'll be moderating those. Um, so the first question I've got, Adam, is from Roger Tonkin, who wants to understand if Australia ceased exporting coal tomorrow, which to be clear isn't on the table, but if it did in a hypothetical, how would that reduce global greenhouse gas emissions? And is it not the case that coal importing countries would just switch to other exports um, that have inferior coal compared to Australia's? 
Yeah, you hear, you heard this argument a lot um, and you continue to hear it from the government and even now from the opposition who are saying, oh, well, we're not going to do anything that affects coal exports because other countries are going to continue to export it. And, um, and I say this with great respect to the, the questioner, that to me is the drug dealer's defence, right? If, um, if I don't sell on the product, they're going to get a dirtier one from somewhere else around the corner. So it's just it's critical that I go and do it. At some point in history, we're going to have to transition out of coal and gas and onto renewables, right? That, that is going to have to happen if we to have any chance of meeting the climate crisis. That is going to involve all countries around the world at some point stopping selling, mining, burning of coal and gas. Uh, so we need to do it. It's going to have to happen. Um, the question is, can we do it in a way where we substitute other exports for it and look after people in affected communities? And the answer is yes. Um, and we've also got, in terms of the, uh, the impact on the federal budget, we, um, this, we've got a cost of it as part of our plan. Like what would be, if we said no new coal and gas mines from today, what would be the impact on the federal budget over the next 10 years? And um, it's, it's eminently manageable. It's around about $500 million a year. Like that's how little royalties and tax a lot of these corporations play, uh, pay. We can substitute other things for it. We can definitely do it. Um, in a way that supports our economy. Uh, but look, you know, the, the, and, and I'll come back to that point about um, what's happening on the world stage. Uh, it's not going to be, like Australia's such a big player in the coal market that it's, A, it's not easily substitutable. Um, and B, like if Australia starts saying we're getting out of coal, it will have massive flow on effects. Like it won't be necessarily that others jump in and say oh well we'll sell it to you it could have exactly the reverse effect which is that oh well if australia is moving and something is seriously happening here we need to get onto it and move it so um that that would be it's, i know that's a sort of a long answer but it's an important question but that's um i think where we've got to go yeah, and a lot of people ask the question, you know, and uh, and as you say, it, it does come up in the debate, so important to be able to address it. Um, Richie, uh, Adam referred there just to, I think, um, you know, uh, how little tax gas and coal companies actually pay, and I know the Australia Institute had some research out this week in particular looking at gas companies. Can you just give us an idea? We often hear about the fossil fuel industry being the backbone of the economy, which we at the Australia Institute know as rubbish, but what did that research show this week about how much they're actually contributing to the economy? The research this week looked at five members of APIA, so five big gas multinational companies, um, who would be attending the Appia Gas Conference this week, which our colleague Mark Oag is there. Uh, and what we found is those five companies uh, earned in terms of income about $138 billion over the last seven years and paid nothing in terms of income tax. So $138 billion, seven years, zero in terms of their receipts. And we look at how much they said that they would be paying, which was in the billions, and it shows you that they will do everything they can to make sure that, that tax bill is lower. So, so we all on this call right now are paying far more tax than those five big multinationals like Chevron, like Shell. And a lot of that was from Queensland's coal seam gas, which also the Queensland government and the Australian government promised would return a fair bit to Australian and Queensland coffers, and it hasn't. One Australian company we did find, Santos, paid six million um, whilst making over 20 billion. Uh, from that gas. And so what we're finding is that the tax receipts, the income, the benefit financially to Australia is low, if not nothing. And the employment is also low. During the pandemic, when the federal government decided to have a gas fired recovery, the gas industry fired 10% of its employees. Um, this was not something and the usual amount of direct employees in the gas industry is maybe about 25,000 people in Australia. So, you know, less than half a percent of our workforce in Australia. So really gas hasn't been a major employer. It hasn't been a major beneficiary for the Australian public in terms of tax receipts. And in return, we just get more and more emissions. That's really the, the big picture here. 
Yeah, and I think I saw a response from the head of Appia saying that we hadn't counted royalties and other things. But to be clear to everyone on this call, royalties aren't taxes. That's actually the fees that they're supposed to pay for access to the gas that we collectively yes. own. Uh, it's very different to yeah, taxes. They're paying for just, Australian gas. That's fine. Quickly correct something. I said that um, uh, when we had it costed that if you just said no new um, coal, oil or gas in Australia, that it might be somewhere around about $500 million a year. Um, I was wrong. It's actually $3.8 billion over 10 years. So you're talking on average about $380 million over that decade. And like I was, I still remember the, uh, when I went to Western Australia to talk about how little royalties they're paying, like they're getting the gas for free. Um, the Australia Institute research that shows that the West Australian government earns more from car regos than it does from royalties from the gas industry that's making billions of dollars of profits a year is just telling and it's the same kind of thing happening on the national stage. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the next question is from Sabine Karcher. She says that Green Senator Lydia Thorpe made some great points on NITV's The Point on environmental justice and what can be done to give First Nations people a stronger voice to be heard on environmental and other human rights concerns in a way that would get the mainstream on board. Yeah, this is um, uh, Lydia Thorpe is our Senator for Victoria and our First Nations spokesperson who's up for re-election this time. Uh, a key part of our powering past coal and gas plan is to ensure the First Nations communities are resourced to essentially power themselves and generate electricity um, for themselves and owners and, and become owners of the electricity that's generated from the sun and the wind and use it uh, to support themselves. We also want to see a massive, massive increase in the uh, what's been called the Indigenous Rangers program of effectively the government saying that we are going to start acknowledging the knowledge that First Nations people have about um, uh, looking after the environment um, and ensuring that we live sustainably and caring for our country. One of the big things that we want to see in this country is in the next parliament, and we think we can get movement on this, is progress towards uh, all of those elements of the Uluru Statement from the Heart, which includes truth and treaty, where there's progress happening in Victoria at the moment, which means beginning to tell the truth with the Truth and Justice Commission about the violence and dispossession that lies at the heart of this country. So that we can then move to join, indeed, other Commonwealth countries who've done this with a treaty that recognises First Nations owners and gives them a much greater say in um, what is happening in this country. So that's something that we would like to see progress on during the course of the next parliament. And we've got um, two out of 10 of our current party members are First Nations women. I think it's the highest proportion, well, it is the highest proportion of any of the parties in the parliament. And I think if the whole parliament was 20% First Nations representatives, um, then I think we could say, as your question asked, that there was, uh, that First Nations were having a say uh, and having a, a much greater influence on what happens in this country than is currently the case. Yeah, and we certainly know that a lot of big uh, resource projects affect First Nations communities very directly. Uh, so it is really important um, that they are there at the table. Um, the next couple of questions I've got, one from Mitzi Took and one from Michael McKeever. Both of them are asking about managing the impacts to the natural environment of the transition to renewables and asking, for example, about uh, those mining of rare earth metals that you were talking about earlier and um, how you manage potential impacts from mining and balanced against, obviously, tackling climate change, I guess. Yeah, th those critical questions and built into our policy and our plan, and you'll see it if you... Um, uh, have time to have a look through it on uh, on our website is that it's got to be um, done with First Nations owners consent and also to the highest environmental standards because like we've got to we've got to start looking um, I mean our environment laws need a massive massive overhaul there are too many loopholes in there and they have very weak protections including on resources projects and so we are um, strongly arguing to lift the standards of environmental protections in this country after the election, including by having a strong environmental watchdog that would assess including those kind of mining projects that, um, that I was talking about and that your question was asking about. So it absolutely critically has to be there. So I don't think it's a 
um, it's not a question of trading off, of saying, oh, well, we need to suffer some kind of um, uh, uh, unacceptable environmental impact. No, we need to lift, lift the, um, the standards right across the country, including for projects like that. Uh, but look, you know, one of the biggest threats to say the Great Barrier Reef uh, is the climate crisis and um, the Murray-Darling Basin uh, um, deforestation and farming practices are big problems, but um, the climate crisis is a massive problem uh, and we're going to see a massive decline in uh, the Murray-Darling Basin if we don't get um, the climate crisis under control. So ultimately one of the, the big things when it is comes back to the main point about coal and gas um, like that's why we need the transition because one of the biggest what we're facing not just a climate emergency but an environment emergency and an extinction crisis as well um, so that's key for us and is lastly like central to our um, plan about tackling this is a big big push for uh, a big massive restore restoration of biodiversity and restoration of our rivers um, that's a big job creation program if we can get the government to fund it uh, and that's absolutely critical not only to tackling the climate crisis but to stopping the extinction crisis. I've got a question next from Mark Nguyen who says I believe uh, or asks about CCS carbon capture and storage being a sham um, and that the head of the CSIRO spoke in the Fin review today about how valuable that technology is going to be to a net zero future. I'm just constantly amazed by how much money we throw away on CCS, Adam. But um, we are seeing other kind of, I guess, uh, false solutions being put forward, not only CCS, but also this idea of clean hydrogen, which also somehow includes hydrogen that's generated from fossil fuels. I mean, how important is it that we don't put waste more money on these solutions that kind of aren't going to reduce emissions. Yeah, look, I'm sure Richie's got a lot to um, tell us about uh, CCS, uh, but the, I mean, the rest of the world can see through this, right? Like the reason that there's a shift towards uh, green hydrogen, so that's hydrogen used as a fuel that's produced by through renewable means. So you, you, you use it in a way that doesn't create pollution. Um, the reason a lot of our trading partners have said, oh, we're interested in green hydrogen, is that they want to cut their pollution, right? And they're, they, they're doing this because this is their contribution to tackling the climate crisis. If we use public money, as the government is talking about, to invest in making hydrogen from gas or coal, and even labour supports it from coal here in Victoria, no one's going to want to buy it, right? Everyone's going to be able to see through that this is just coal and gas repackaged in another form. The pollution will still be there. The market in the rest of the world is not for coal and gas produced hydrogen. It's going to be for green hydrogen. We'll be left with these massive white elephants and these stranded assets if we keep going down this road of pretending that we can convert gas and coal into hydrogen, as in many instances Liberal and Labor are wanting to do. Um, but we've got this huge opportunity here. Like you do need a lot of energy to create green hydrogen, to split water into hydrogen and oxygen and use that hydrogen as a fuel. Um, but we've got a lot of space and we've got a lot of capacity to, um, to have the solar and the wind energy here. It's one of those things that like, could be our massive, massive competitive advantage if we choose to take it. Yeah, Richie, uh, I know the Institute and our climate and energy program in particular have been doing a lot of work around not only CCS, but hydrogen. Do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, the research that we, the program put out today around clean hydrogen shows that it really is an effective marketing tool. Around four and five Australians don't know the definition of clean hydrogen, according to the government's basically created this term and it can include fossil fuel based hydrogen with carbon capture and storage or renewable based hydrogen. And that is because it confuses people into thinking this is a clean source of energy. When you make hydrogen from fossil fuels, you end up with more pollution than if you just burnt the fossil fuels directly. So it's a ridiculous way to actually give fossil fuels a facelift. But we're finding that that confusing term is working in terms of most people not knowing what they're buying. The, at the end of the day, if you look at Victoria's brown coal hydrogen project, which there was a big fanfare earlier this year because they shipped their first amount of, of hydrogen, that 
Minister Taylor said it would reduce 1.8 million tons of emissions if that fully operationalized because they would ideally eventually bury those emissions. They haven't buried those emissions. They're unlikely to do so. And our research finds that in fact, it will probably increase emissions by about 3.8 million tons uh, per year as well. So instead of reducing emissions, it will increase emissions. That's the real risk if we go down this path of fake solutions. And so we should only be investing in this renewable based hydrogen and we should stop funding carbon capture and storage, which continues to fail upwards in terms of earning more public dollars. And if Very, I can briefly, Evan, just yeah. quickly, we do have, you know, proven carbon capture and storage, and it's called forests. <laughs> it's called native yeah. forests in particular. And uh, one of the best things we can do to continue to store and suck CO2 out is to leave native forests standing. Absolutely. Uh, haven't found a better uh, carbon capture and storage <laughs> method to date. Uh, and um yeah, I've been watching that debate happen for at least 15 years and it seems to me the only thing that carbon capture and storage is good at capturing and storing is taxpayers' money. Um, the next question that I've got here is from Jennifer Manson who asks, why don't the Greens talk more about pollution to local people and um, communities affected by coal-fired power stations, including the direct impacts on health. Do the Greens have anything to say about that? Yeah, it's a really good point. And um, we we have been over the years, particularly around things like coal dust uh, in some a lot of the areas of uh, Hunter Valley in particular, it continually crops up, um, especially when there's talk of new projects and new uh, uh, trains, coal trains coming through. Often when, they, when it's uncovered coal, like you get the dust that comes out of that and starts affecting people. Uh, it's critical. With respect to gas, the, uh, one of the things that we've learned is that um, gas in households is responsible for 12% of childhood asthma. And uh, we're a big part of our plan that I haven't mentioned um, before, but is to give households and industries support to get off gas and onto electricity within the household. So things like grants to um, support the shift over to induction cooktops, where it might be a bit expensive, too expensive to buy it up front. But um, if you can make that initial investment, then you end up not only it being cheaper and having less impact on the planet, but it's actually healthier for you inside your home. Uh, I do think you're right that I think there is a lot of space there, perhaps even more than, than us or any others have sort of jumped into yet about uh, continuing to talk about the health benefits of acting on climate and the direct consequences of living near coal-fired power stations or of having gas in your home. And I think it's you're right that it's something over the coming years that people are becoming more aware of uh, and it is something that should be talked about more. Yeah, and I'll just um, add to that. I was talking this morning about a new Lancet study that shows pollution killed 2.3 million Indians in 2019 um, and that uh, in particular air pollution globally is responsible for 6.7 million deaths in 2019. Um, so it is um, a very big issue and Thanks for that fantastic question. Um, uh, Adam, I've got a very political question here from Gregor Lawrence, who says, why in Queensland have the Greens put the ALP number five uh, on the above the line voting advice when the ALP has the Greens at number two? Can you um, talk to us a little bit about Greens preferences this election? Yeah, so we're um, preferencing the Labor Party above the Liberals everywhere uh, that, that we're allocating preferences because we want to see a change of government and then um, below the Liberals go uh, One Nation and um, Clive Palmer and others. That's the general rule. There might be some variations around the place, but we're preferencing Labor and in some of those seats where the climate independents are running, where independents are running, we're preferencing those independents as well. Uh, and, of course, it's up to people, it's up to you to decide where you want to allocate your own preferences parties can only recommend it we've got we got rid of the system where um, they can be directed by the party so you get to decide where your preferences go um, we're trying very hard to see a change of government and a progressive senate and so that's why we're um, preferencing the Labor Party in the senate as well as in the house but there are other parties who are also running who um, our state branches and our uh, locals and our national organisations also think uh, are worthy of support in terms of preferences. But I guess the one thing that I would say, well, it's two things I would say. One is you get to decide where your own preferences go. But secondly, 
Um, this election, you can safely vote Greens knowing it's a vote to change the government. Preferences will be going to Labor, uh, not the Liberals. Um, and it, in some of those seats where the independents are running, we're suggesting preferences to the independents as well, um, but then Labor and then to, to the Liberals. So you can safely vote Greens knowing your preferences won't go to the Liberals. Thanks, Adam. Uh, the next question I've got is from Heather de Cruz, and she asks, is there any potential for progressive parties beginning public information campaigns between elections rather than just during campaigns um, and uh, talking about many serious issues between elections? How do the Greens engage in, with communities between election campaigns? Yeah, it's a really good point. And the um, we've begun to do that sort of a fair bit more and it was uh, tricky during COVID when everyone sort of had to change the way that they operated but one of the things that we did um, was start to have a lot more online discussions uh, about serious issues and we found that especially during lockdowns where um, like people were craving that connection with other people and craving that connection with politics that people responded to that and liked it and in Queensland at the moment we're running some really strong campaigns in uh, seats like Griffith and Ryan and Brisbane and in Griffith they've really uh, spent a lot of time um, over a number of years now campaigning not just to talk about like why you should vote for the Greens but also to engage with people on a lot of local issues and um, have that for have those forums have those discussions between election times it is something that we'd um, that we've started to invest in doing a bit more and uh, I think it's something that within our limited resources we'd like to do more because yeah politics shouldn't just be about what happens at election time we've got to mm. keep up the discussion in between um, and I did just want to come, we've only got uh, five minutes to go Adam but so often when we talk about climate change it's um, you know, very much portrayed in negative terms, but, you know, we're just talking about the health impacts um, and benefits to, to health from reducing uh, pollution. How important is it to paint a picture for people of what the opportunities are for tackling climate and phasing out fossil fuels and things like that? Look, it's really important because it's not only going to mean a safer climate for you and your kids, it's going to mean people having good um secure, well-paying jobs that don't involve the planet being cooked and that people feel good about. And the um, our plan, the Power and Pass Coal and Gas Plan, uh, not only delivers budget uh, money for the budget, but it will create 805,000 jobs over the next decade. And they're going to be good, well-paying jobs in areas that people want to work in. And I think um, like looking at us as a country, like one of the big questions that comes up as we've discussed during this is, well, what do we do if we stop selling coal and gas? It's like, well, we could sell the rest of the world our sun and our wind. Like, we've got this massive, massive opportunity here in Australia. We could be the place that other, you bring your business from overseas because you know you can get cheap, clean electricity in Australia. We could become like the manufacturing hub or the, the data hub for the area because we, we shift this surplus mentality um, and create a lot more electricity. And the jobs that are in the, that are there, if we bring down the cost of electricity by making it renewable, the jobs that are there in manufacturing are huge, huge as well. So uh, I do think it's important to, um, to make it clear. And I think this election, maybe we're starting to see a bit of a tipping point in that, people understanding that there's massive opportunities for us. And, you know, I get to meet a lot of interesting and good people in this job. And one of them was the... Um, a climate advisor to Angela Merkel, the, the German, former German chancellor, who said, um, I'm not going to try a German accent, you'll just have to imagine it, but who said, said to me, look, we in Germany, where we're putting up so much solar and doing so much research into renewables, we look at you in Australia with your intellectual capacity, your manufacturing capacity, all the sun and the wind, and we just scratch our heads and we wonder why is it cloudy Germany that has been leading the way in this? And I think that's the opportunity that's there for us for the taking. And it's been a big part of what we've, uh, as I've toured around those coal and gas regions in Queensland and New South Wales and around the country, been a pains to say, look, there's a real opportunity here for us. And a lot of these jobs in it look a lot like the jobs you are doing now. They're just gonna be ones that help create wealth and safeguard your kids' future. Mm. 
Well, I think we might have to wrap it up there. Thank you so much, everyone, for your fantastic questions. As always, I'm afraid uh, and I'm sorry that we couldn't get to all of them. Thank you, Adam, for your time today. I know you must be absolutely out there on the hustings every day. So we appreciate you coming on to talk about us and really shining a light, I think, on an issue that hasn't had um, the exposure that it deserves during this campaign. We really appreciate it. Thanks, Richie, um, for coming on as well. Um, if people are interested in anything that um, Adam has talked about today, I'm sure you can find that on the Greens website, greens.org.au. Um, the Australia Institute research on the zero tax that gas companies pay, uh, who are members of Appia and all the other stuff that we've talked about, including the billions wasted on CCS, you can find at australiainstitute.org.au. Don't forget to sign up to our podcast, Follow the Money, you can find that on iTunes or wherever you normally listen to podcasts. This week, we're talking about our new research showing that the number of political appointments to the Administrative Appeals Tribunal has skyrocketed to 40% under the current government. So it's a good episode. I hope you listen to that. Thank you so much for joining us today, everyone. Don't forget to vote. It's so important. And don't forget you've got two votes, one in the lower house and one in the Senate. And uh, you've got a number at least one to six across the line, above the line in the Senate, but that's not all you can do. Uh, if you really don't want a party to get into power, make sure you put them very last, number all the boxes above the line or all the boxes below the line uh, to really make your vote count. Uh, we know a lot of people don't necessarily understand how Senate voting works. So don't forget to pay attention to your Senate vote as well. It's so important. Um, thank you so much for joining us, Adam, today. Thanks, everyone out there. Happy election. <laughs> Talk to you soon. Bye.